Welcome to the Glenn Beck Program. Massive void of leadership and truth today. I defy you to find the truth when picking up the newspaper or watching the news. No matter what the story is, challenge everything you read. Take Japan, you have people freaking out because the media is freaking out. And so now in California, they're buying iodine ta uh, tablets. No, 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 that's great. The United States Surgeon General has supported the idea as a worthy precaution, even though other health officials will tell you, ask your doctor, that's really unnecessary and you don't want to take that stuff unless you're told to because it can cause other problems. Where's the truth? Well, believe it or not, I found it in one of the most unbelievable places. I actually have respect for this guy because he's never changed his story, ever. He's finally standing up and telling the truth yet again in even a more frank way. The truth teller today, Reverend Jeremiah Wright, watch this video from last month. Neither Hannity, Beck, O'Reilly, nor the Tea Party would have liked yeah. Michael at all. Mike, Michael sounds, when you read his work, Michael sounds like a left-wing liberal. He sounds like a liberation theologian. Plus, Michael was black. That would make him a black liberation theologian. Instead of preaching prosperity and capitalism, mistakenly called Christianity, Michael sounded like a socialist. Michael almost sounds like a Marxist. Okay, he goes on to talk about how evil the devil is, capitalism, and that's what the real war is all about, against capitalism, and you should hear what he says about America, and so much more. It's at glenbeck.com. To call black liberation theology, the guy who's done it on television now for the last few years, that was crazy. That was crazy when I first said, that's Marxism, taking the shots. Mm -hmm. That was Obama's church for 20 years. Marxist and socialist. Now they're finally admitting it. Thank you for the truth, Reverend Jeremiah Wright. Hello, America. I said it yesterday, and I think it, I think I should say it again. The president may have been hit with a tranquilizer sh uh, dart or maybe a stun gun. I'm not sure. His fans in the press have always calm, caused his, uh, called his calmness measured, thoughtful. I think it's about time we start to consider the possibility of sedation. It might be. It's bizarre to watch how he is behaving while the globe is melting down all around him. You remember his excuse for not talking about Libya? He actually said he had a scheduling conflict and so he couldn't talk about Libya. Tiffany, Tiffany, Sky God producing, Tiffany, are you there? I'm here, what's up? Thank you. Would you remind me tomorrow I am doing the story? Force me to do the story on Libya tomorrow, will you? I promise. Because it, it goes right into Jeremiah Wright. He couldn't talk about Libya because he had a scheduling com uh, uh, conflict. He, you know, he had to coach his daughter's basketball game, you know, when his daughter wasn't there because the coach had a scheduling conflict. But anyway, he couldn't stand in front of the camera and say anything about it. He was that busy. Now, how tight is his schedule? Oh, you can't believe how busy he is. He's, I mean, he's doing stuff, you know, in the White House. Um, pay no attention to that. That's okay. He's filling out the NCAA bracket, but... Um, Okay, all right, well, people do that. I mean, they'll, you know, say who they... No, there he is actually f filling it in on ES... Okay, all right, but he's busy filling out brackets for ESPN in a fully produced segment. He shot this yesterday. You know, he's got to go over the matchups and stuff, but he cannot squeeze five minutes in to talk about genocide in Libya. No, no, can't do it. I've got that full segment on ESPN to talk about college basketball. Now, if he, if he wasn't so busy with this, maybe he could learn about what's happening in the Middle East. Remember, he said, youth of the world, rise up. Rise up 
And, and anybody who says that these are Marxists or this is going to be worse for America, you're a crazy hate monger. That's what you are. I'll tell you that right now. They love us. These kids, they understand Apple. These kids, they're on Facebook and Twitter. They're just like you. Rise up, youth of, 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 of the whole world. Rise up. And he was really praising those guys. And even the State Department and his, his people all work together. Google worked together with the youth of Egypt because they're just like us. Well, Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, she arrived in Cairo this morning. She was ready to meet with those youth, the young people. She was snubbed by the Revolution Youth Coalition. Yeah, they didn't have any, no, huh? they didn't want to meet with her at all. They said, quote, based on Clinton's negative position from the beginning of the revolution and the position of the U.S. administration in the Middle East, we reject this invitation. <laughs> Things are going to get good. Who did he pick? The winner of the final four. Do we know? We'll get back to you with that news. We've got to look at the president's priorities. Could be, could be that he's focusing on the fact that food prices saw their biggest jump since 1974. Yeah. Yep. That's just before Carter came in and make things really bad. Biggest since 1974 food prices. Well, the president of the New York Federal Reserve was asked about it because he was giving a speech and he says, look, I, you got the cost of things going up. Please, do you know you can buy an iPad 2 for the same thing that it, you paid for a, an iPad 1 and it's twice as powerful? <laughs> and the audience said, I can't eat an iPad. It's my favorite quote of the day. No, no. President is not worried about food prices going up. No. Instead, the White House has been preparing for a response to the shooting of Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords. They have been working very hard. I'm going to give you how long they've been working on it here in a minute, but they've been working very hard. They finally pinpointed the problem. They went in with an open mind. They wanted to find out what the problem was. First, they, first they said maybe it's that rhetoric on television that caused that. That, that didn't really stick. And so they're glad because now they found the problem. It's going to come as a surprise to you. I would have never seen this coming. I never would have seen this administration say the problems that we have in this country are caused by guns. <laughs> Who saw that one coming? The Justice Department explain how they are they're working to try to prevent incidents like this in the future, saying, quote, and I love this, this is, this is the best quote, this is better than I can't eat an iPad. We should focus on sound, effective steps that will keep guns out of the hands of the criminals, fugitives, people with serious mental issues, and others who have no business possessing a gun and who are prohibited by laws on the books from owning a gun. That's deep. We've been working on that for a while. Let's go back to the beginning, shall we? Remember, problem? Guns. Guns. So, what they want to do is focus on sound, effective steps I don't know what those steps are. That will keep guns out of the hands of the criminals. That's good. Hey, wait a minute. Wouldn't one of those sound effective steps be to pass laws? Somebody check and see if there is um, Tiffany. Tiffany. Yes. I thought you were out having coffee again. Can you watch the show? Can you check real quick to find out if there's anything, any law that says criminals should not have guns? Oh, and while you're there, see if there's a law that says fugitives or people with serious mental illness should not have guns. Can you do that for me? You got it, Glenn. Because <laughs> that would be crazy. Wouldn't it be crazy if the law was already there? <laughs> what are the odds? And then also serious steps to make sure that others who have no business possessing a gun. Besides criminals, fugitives, and people with serious mental illness 
who do you suppose those people who have no business possessing a gun would be? That's kind of a little too hopey and changey for me. Could we define that one? Yeah. Anyway, we want to get all those people and those who are prohibited by laws on the books from owning a gun. If you're prohibited by laws on the books from owning a gun, go back to the first page on this one, please. Then wouldn't that be the sound effective step to say, enforce the law? Oh my gosh, I should be president of the United States. <laughs> the problem is that we now have in office a president who picks and chooses which laws. We have a DOJ, a Department of Justice, that doesn't enforce the laws. They are like, yeah, I'm going to enforce it today, but not on Tuesday. Definitely not on Tuesday. I believe we had a president and a DOJ like that last administration as well, except they were doing that with a border. These guys just do it with everything. So the DOJ tried to cobble together support from different groups, including the NRA. How surprising that Wayne LaPierre didn't read that statement and go, well, let me get my airplane ticket to Washington now. Wayne instead responded to the meeting request. Why should the NRA go sit down with a group of people that have spent a lifetime trying to destroy the Second Amendment in the United States? Did they call him too early? Because that sounds cranky. Wayne, let me tell you something. That's why I love you. That's why I love you, Wayne. I do. I love you, love you, love you. Thank you. Don't be used by this administration for a photo op. Now, that might be political suicide. I don't know. But that's why I'm not you. Wayne ask a pretty good question, doesn't he? Why should I sit down with a group of people who have tried to destroy the Second Amendment? Why? Obama tries to play, play the lip service here to the Second Amendment, but his actions and the people he surrounds himself, oh, that's a whole different story, isn't it? Let's just go through his, Barack Obama, this is your life on guns. In a candidate questionnaire from 1996, in the response to the question, do you support legislation to ban handguns? As to ban the manufacture and sale and possession of handguns, he said, yes. I don't think he's being an honest broker, if that's what he believes. This is from 2004. Quote, I'm consistently on record and will continue to be on record as opposing concealed carry. Hot damn, really? Are you for open carry? Because I am. I've always wanted to have, you know, one like on my hip and maybe some spurs. Psh, psh, psh. You support my Second Amendment on that one, do you, Barack? Because I'll go. <laughs> I'd wear one today. As a state senator in 2004, Obama voted to uphold local gun, uh, gun banning laws. He, uh, he was also for the criminal prosecution. I love this one for those who use guns in their own self-defense. Wow. As a senator in 2005, Obama voted to ban nearly all rifle ammunition, mostly used for hunting and sports shooting. From his own book, Audacity of Hope in 2006, quote, I believe uh, in keeping guns out of the inner cities uh, and, uh, uh, and that our leaders must say so in the face of gun manufacturers lobby. Amen, Brother Barack. Obama has supported 500% increases in taxes on guns and ammo. Obama was on the board of the leading uh, funder of anti-gun organizations, the Joyce Foundation. And Joyce always seems so nice. He also supported banning gun stores within a five mile radius of any school or park. That sounds reasonable until you start to draw those little circles and you realize, wow, that encompasses almost every gun store in America. And then there's Vice President Joe Biden, a working guy. He's just like you, telling a gun owner that enjoys guns that he's crazy, but he does it with style and hair plugs. Watch. Tell me your position on gun control, as myself and other Americans really want to know if our babies are safe. 
This is my baby. Purchased under the 1994 gun ban. I'll tell you what, if that's his baby, he needs help. Uh, uh, lemming. I am a lemming. I am a lemming. I think, I think he just made an admission against self-interest. I don't know that he's mentally qualified to own that gun. No, I'm not being, I'm being serious. Look, this idea we go around talking about people who, who, who own, I'm the guy that originally wrote the assault weapons ban that, that uh, became law. Yes, he is. Maybe he can help us define who those people are who have no right to own a gun. Then we go to uh, the regulatory czar, the most dangerous man in America. And this is when he's beginning to come into his full power. These are his days. I told you about him and told you earlier uh, or late last year, watch it because now we go into regulatory nightmares. Here is Cass Sunstein. He's called the Second Amendment the Constitution's most mysterious right. He doesn't believe the amendment creates an individual right. No, no, no. That right is so that we can give guns to the militias and to the army. Oh, we had to write that one down? He also suggests that we could be seeing some changes in the courts and what's happening with the guns in three or four years. Watch this. In terms of judicial developments, uh, it is striking and noteworthy that well over two centuries since the founding, uh, the, no, the Supreme Court has never suggested that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to have guns. Not once. It would be amazing, though, given that fact, though, uh, Cover. though don't Cover. be surprised if the first time it happens is in the next three or four years. You know what? That tape was made three or four years ago. Notice he said it like, I, uh, don't, uh, I better not say it out loud. Uh, don't be surprised. Really? By the way, Cass also wants to reverse the Constitution from a charter of negative liberties to a positive liberties, which means government tells you what you're allowed to do, not you telling the government. Sunstein also talked about this. Now, this is this is <laughs> this is so normal. He just thinks we should ban hunting as well. We ought to ban hunting, I suggest, if there isn't a purpose other than sport and fun. That should be against the law. Okay. Wayne, how could you possibly say that you're sitting down with a group of people that have worked their whole life to destroy the Second Amendment? These people are not extremists. It's you, Wayne LaPierre, and your people at the NRA. Wait a minute, I'm one of those people with joined the NRA. <laughs> Wayne LaPierre has nothing in common with these people because he has common sense. He doesn't want banning of rifles and hunting. No, no, they just want to talk about protecting children. Uh-huh. Let me give you a prediction here. But I'm going to need a little, I need a little work here. Prediction. No one in their right mind would join this Obama gun law change. No, they wouldn't. it wouldn't happen. So to get it through Congress, and lucky for him, he, he's already made Congress irrelevant, so he didn't have to worry about them. My prediction is that Cass Sunstein has, well, probably around 2007, uh, has just started drawing out all the new laws or an executive order that Obama will sign when he can find the time to squeeze it in between sports picks. And he's going to look at us with sad puppy dog eyes like this. And he's going to say, I tried to meet with the big bad NRA. I just wanted to protect the people. And now they forced me to do something I don't want to do. I have to. Sign this executive order. Look at the tear. It hurts for me to do it. Yeah, haha, right. That's coming. What's the rest of the media saying? Well, here's the story from the president's recommended reading source, the Huffington Post. Quote, faced with a hostile Congress to even the slightest restrictions of the Second Amendment rights, the Obama administration is exploring potential changes to gun laws that can be secured strictly through executive action. Oh, that pesky Congress, always wanting to protect and defend the Constitution. <laughs> Why must they be so stingy? I mean, well, except for that whole oath thing that they take. You know that old dusty, dirty document has a neat little trick up its sleeve. You can change it at any time. You can. It's a whole process written down in that old dusty document. Read it sometime. It's great, progressives. You'd think that the progressives 
would use it that way. They wouldn't have a problem whipping up support to get things changed in the Constitution, which you can do. Yeah. I mean, it should be easy. They've got pretty much the entire news media, Hollywood, the schools, the White House, but they still can't get the job done. It must be because most of their ideas suck and scare the American people out of their mind when it's explained to them plainly. Yeah. Last time progressives jammed one of their ideas through, America's got prohibition. Oh, and the Federal Reserve and the income tax, all in one administration. It was great. In fact, it was so great that they had to uh, start hiding and saying that they weren't progressives, uh, they were liberals. And it took America 70 years to forget what a nightmare progressives really were. Watch for this executive order. Oh, and there's one other priority the president's working on. Schools and education with his union buddies. Next.